Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning to the Henderson Church of Christ. If you are visiting with us this morning, we'd uh, ask you for to stick around for a few moments after services so we can get to know you. Uh, at this time, I would ask uh, members and visitors alike to uh, take an attendance card from the pew in front of you, fill that out, and pass it to the outside aisles. Uh, prayer request. David Patterson is a nephew of Laverne Thomason, is undergoing treatments for bone cancer in Woodstock, Georgia. Joanne Bass, a, f a friend of Sherry Rashidian, uh, fell and broke her leg this week. Uh, congratulations to uh, Nora Newman. Uh, Nora was baptized at Western Kentucky Youth Camp. Uh, she is the daughter of Matt and Leah Newman. Also, we ask that you uh, check out the nursery. Uh, there's been some updates to that. We'd like to thank Sherry Rashidian, uh, Remy Bryant, and Darby Salis Salisbury for that. So uh, if you get a chance, uh, stop by there and take a look at that. Uh, activities this week, to remember to sign up for the marriage workshop with uh, Trey and Leah Morgan on July 24th. Uh, you can sign up online on the website. Uh, they ask if you're on Facebook to please share that too. It's, it's for the uh, community here. It's for anyone uh, in Henderson. Uh, youth group, there will not be a garage gathering this week. Um, the Wednesday night meal, uh, it's catered by Fazoli's this week, but you uh, must sign up by tonight, and so we can give the caterer account. Uh, those meals are $4. Also, our summer series continues this week. We are focusing on traveling light and looking at things we need to uh, leave behind as we walk with Jesus. Uh, our speaker this week will be Tim Martin. Uh, he will talk to us in, uh, about leaving the bitterness behind. Uh, also, the youth group and college age group will go to the shoes property, not the home. Uh, if you need to know where the property is at, you could uh, see Scott and Gina uh, to get the address for that property. Uh, that is on next Saturday from uh, 7 to 9 p.m. Dinner and games will be provided. Josh will be taking the bus. If you need a ride, let Josh or Emily know. Uh, they will be leaving here around 6.30. Also, next Sunday following uh, worship service, the mentors for the youth group will have a brief meeting in the teen room. And the youth group, 6th uh, grade to 12th grade, will go to Walter's Mini Golf on Tuesday, July 20th. Uh, the cost is $12 per person. Uh, the bus will leave um, the building at 1.30. And uh, please sign up in the lobby. And also, I'd like to uh, congratulate Bob and Mary McIndoo on uh, the wedding last night, uh, Kelly and Mason were married. It was probably the most adverse weather conditions uh, a person or anyone could endure. Uh, they, for those who weren't there, it rained, the wind blew, um, but uh, they made it through it. It was a great accomplishment, but uh, they got married, so congratulations. Also, we're opening prayer this morning. Those serving us, Shane Boggess will be opening prayer. Uh, song leader is Jesse Tapp. Uh, Lord's Supper will be uh, by Rodney Newton. Scripture reading will be by Jerry Burrow. Uh, closing prayer will be uh, Bill Bridwell. And the lesson this morning will be brought to us by Adam Currents. That concludes our announcements. We will now begin worship service. Walking alone at even, viewing the skies afar. Bidding the darkness come to welcome me, silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. Guiding His power and light is showing His truth and love. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His force to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Savior's love, where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above, sitting alone at eve and dreaming the hours away, watching the shadows fall me now at the close of day. God in His mercy comes with His word He is drawing near, spreading His love and truth Oh, 
Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Closing my eyes at eve and thinking of heaven's grace. Longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting Him face to face. Trusting Him as my all, wheresoever my footsteps roam. Pleading with Him to guide me onto the Spirit's home. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, one streeting by the Savior's love. Pray with me, please. Most loving Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time just thanking you for today. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come here to this place and to sing songs of praise and to study from your word to grow closer to you. We, praise, we pray that everything we do here this morning is good and well in your sight. We're so thankful for all of our blessings. Each and every one of us is richly blessed. Most of all, we're thankful for Jesus and just his love for us and the sacrifice he made for us. We look forward to a day when with, when with you and him in heaven. This time we pray that you're with your church here that meets here in Henderson. We ask that you be with the leadership and the ministers and each and every one of us. We pray that we're all the light in this community that you would have us to be. This time we ask that you be with those that are sick, those that are hurting, those that have upcoming tests and procedure. Be with them as only, only that you can, dear Lord. We also pray for those that are hurting for various other reasons that this morning. We all know that you know us better than we, we do ourselves, and we ask that you just be with them in the, in the way that, only way that you can. Pray with our youth, those that are going to camp this week. We're so thankful for West Kentucky Youth, youth Camp and place that our youth can go and to fellowship with one another and make memories and to grow closer to you. We ask that those that are going this week, please be with them. Please keep them safe. Please let them have a good time and ultimately grow to love you. Be with us now the remainder of this service. Please be with our speaker this morning. Please be with him and let him recall the things that he's prepared and let us leave here today and um, be better because of our time here. So thank for your son once again. Forgive us when we fall short. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of our love, for Jesus who died and is found on above. Pray.
have some brief thoughts to help us further prepare our minds for partaking of the Lord's Supper. I'd like to read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even though Paul was writing here to the church at Philippia, Philippi, uh, I think he was trying to lift them up and help them, but he's also, uh, I think these words speak to us today. And when he said, let this mind be, be in you, I think Paul is telling us that we should pattern our lives after Christ. And uh, some of the characteristics that were mentioned uh, previously in this chapter, maybe humility, love, and patience, uh, these are all characteristics of Christ that we should try to, to duplicate in our lives and, and to pattern after him. Uh, we are to have a servant's attitude and be obedient to God, just as, as Christ was obedient even to the point of death on the cross. Uh, so this morning, uh, each first day of the week, we remember Jesus' suffering and death on the cross and that it was a volu voluntary laying down of his life. Uh, it was a sacrifice for the salvation of all people, and uh, it was in obedience to the Father's will. If you'd like to, go ahead and uh, uncover the bread. You bow with me as we pray. God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all the blessings of life, and especially now for this privilege to come together to, to share in this communion. We're thankful that Jesus was, was obedient and was willing to, to give his life and suffer there on the cross as our sacrifice for our sins. And we now take this unleavened bread in remembrance of his body. We pray that we'll do this in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like, you can uncover the through the vine. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we continue this memorial to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, being thankful for the power of his blood to wash away our sins and to continue to cleanse us daily. We now take this through the vine in remembrance of his, his blood, which was shed there for our sins. Uh, Help us to do this in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There should be some baggies nearby where you can deposit your, your empty containers. They'll be picked up later. Concludes the Lord's Supper at this time. Another part of our worship is that we give back as we've been prospered. Would you bow with me as we pray? God and Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the, the many wonderful blessings that you bestow upon us. We know that all things come from you, and you're the giver of all good gifts. We give back a part of that to you so the work of this congregation may continue and help us to be mindful to give of our time and our talents and to also con always conduct ourselves in a manner pleasing unto thee. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I forgot to mention, there are plastic containers uh, at the back of the auditorium. Or remember, you can always uh, give online. There's a peace I've come to know.
scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Good morning. It is good to be with you as we study God's word together today. Um, You have always been such an encouragement to me and my family, and I just want you to know that how much I deeply appreciate that. Uh, especially now that my family has grown, and you know I need all the encouragement I can get. Bill Bridwell is my father-in-law, so if you know Bill, you know. I'm just kidding, Bill. Bill is great to me, wherever he's sitting right now. Have you ever wondered what Jesus looked like? We've got some popular depictions, whether it's in media or in illustrations, about what Jesus might have actually looked like. We've got... um, What most often, unfortunately, is very much an an Americanized Jesus. Um, There are some paintings throughout history of what Jesus could have looked like. Um, This picture on the left that you see um, was a study done by the BBC a few years ago, 
And they tried to study historical data and the time and the region in which Jesus lived. And that might actually be the closest uh, to what we'll ever get to what Jesus actually looked like. Now, does the Bible spend a lot of time telling us what Jesus looked like? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, uh, Isaiah chapter 53 says that really, chapter 53 verse 2 really says that Jesus really didn't have an appearance worth writing home about. The fact of the matter is Jesus was just an ordinary person. He was just a human like you and I. He was not a superhuman. Um, The irony is that if we spend as much time trying to listen and follow Jesus as we did about trying to figure out what he looked like, the entire world would would be better off. I want to think today about portraits of Jesus, specifically in the book of Hebrews. But if you had to to describe Jesus to a friend or to a family, what would you say? And how does the Bible say? For example, you might say, well, he was God in the flesh. You might say he died for our sins. You might say he was the perfect son of God. Biblically, there are several different New Testament words and phrases, such as Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was the bread of life. He's our cornerstone. He's the good shepherd. And none of these give an entire picture about what Jesus is and what he does. Instead, they really give us glimpses of his person and his work. And so of all of the things we could say about Jesus from Hebrews, I want to think together with you about three portraits of Christ from Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is one of the most theologically rich books of the New Testament. It was written to describe the superiority of the New Covenant over the Old Covenant. Um, it's possible that there were Christians who had become, uh, who, or, excuse me, who were formerly Jewish, and they were tempted to go back to Judaism. And the author is pleading and begging and encouraging them, don't go back to something that can no longer save you. Why go back to something inferior in comparison to Jesus? And so I want to think together with you some portraits of Jesus, three things about Jesus today from the book of Hebrews. The first is in chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. We'll read that together. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. In other words, Jesus destroyed Satan's power over us and has liberated us from Satan's power, liberated us from our sins. You know, we sometimes give Satan more credit than he deserves. We almost talk about him as if he's some omnipotent being who just can cast a spell over us and we're powerless over him. Now, there is a sense in which when we are living in sin and and we are living a life not pleasing to God, are we, are we powerless? In a sense, we are, right? We are uh, under, the, under the, the, the allure and under the deception of Satan. And, but what Scripture says is that that is no longer the case. Christ has destroyed not Satan himself, but his power over you. <clears throat> Satan is a liar. Satan is the father of lies. He's the greatest salesman. He convinces people to give away their soul for a moment's pleasure, for just a moment of happiness. But we no longer are powerless. Satan has no power over you except for what you allow him to have. And so Jesus has destroyed. He's a destroyer of Satan's power. But he's also a great liberator. Now, I'm no historian, and if you know me, you know I'm awful with dates and places and events. But if I got this right, what you see on your screen is April 29th, 1945, as U.S. troops liberated Uh, Dachau, the Nazi Germany concentration camp in Dachau. Um, What a sight that must have been to see. You know, if you could ever hop back on a time machine and go back to a a moment in history, what must it have been like for these slaves uh, to experience freedom? Now, I want you to imagine that the U.S. troops showed up and they, you know, they got rid of all the, the evildoers. They opened the gates, they opened the cells and said, hey, you're free to leave. And the people just stood there and said, no, we want to stay. Can you imagine that? Jesus made it clear from the very beginning of his ministry. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus stood up in the synagogue, and one of the scriptures that he read was was that he came to liberate, to free the captives. Jesus came to set us free from our sins. 
But more than that, if you reflect back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, <clears throat> Jesus came to set us free from fear of death. Think about how, much, how many decisions we make in our lives to free us from the fear of death. None of these things are wrong. We all do these things, but you know, we, we, we strive to look young. We want to, look, look, we want to work out so we can keep our bodies in shape and looking young. We might do things uh, cosmetically. We do things financially. We, we have life insurance. We have wills in place for our estates. We put cameras on our homes and cameras on our cars. We do so many things to insulate our lives because we're afraid of death. Now, I'm not encouraging you to do away with all of those things. In many ways, those can be very responsible things. But there's a sense, and the Hebrews writer is tapping into this, that we are all slaves of this fear of death. Now, I want you to think that Jesus does not want you to be afraid of dying. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're not going to turn there today together, but it's a marvelous chapter on death and the resurrection. But one of the most powerful things in 1 Corinthians 15 is verse 26, and here's what it says. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So think about that for just a moment. God considers death an enemy. And one day when all things are made right again, death will be destroyed. Now, death is not destroyed yet. We experience death. We experience grief. We experience loss and illness. And those things are horrible. And working through those things can take so much time and energy in our lives. But one day, death will no longer be here. Now, in the here and now, Jesus still does not want us to be afraid of death. He has liberated us from that. When you have wept at the funeral of a loved one, Jesus has wept beside you. Jesus hates grief and pain just as much as you do, and Jesus hates to see us cower in fear of death. He defeated death through his own resurrection, and one day death will be no more. For, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 says, For this reason I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day, right? We are committed to Christ and we are secure in him. And so I give my life to God and I trust in him to preserve me. Christ has destroyed Satan's power and he has liberated us from slavery. We have nothing to fear. There's a portrait of Jesus in Hebrews. The second today is Jesus as a merciful high priest. Now, if you just sat down and took 30 minutes to read Hebrews all the way through, you're going to see many times Jesus compared to the priesthood. And here's some things that is said. Jesus is a sympathetic priest. He's a sinless priest. He's called by God. He's in the line of Melchizedek. He's better than Aaron. I'm going to run out of fingers here. He lives forever. He's holy, innocent, undefiled, separated. He's exalted. And he offers himself. He doesn't offer a lamb. He offers himself. Jesus was merciful. Let's think about that word for just a second. He was merciful and could be merciful, can be merciful, because he is made like us. Jesus understands what we experience. Remember, Jesus was flesh and blood, just like you and I. Jesus wasn't Superman. He, he wasn't impervious to pain and grief and sorrow. <clears throat> How much easier is it to extend mercy to someone when you've had the same experience? You, you know, I, I've never lost my parents. Now, can, can I comfort someone who's lost their parents? To a degree, yes. But imagine somebody who knows exactly the steps you've taken in your life. How much greater comfort might you be able to find in that person? That's what Jesus is for us. Okay? Jesus is merciful. He's walked our path. Um, and he also, the, the idea of mercy is that you, you don't give something that's deserved. So you think about a child. I, I'm, I'm only four years into parenting, and I'm, I'm already seeing this, right? There's times where you say, if you do X, Y, or Z, this is going to happen. And then X, Y, or Z happens. And then you're like, well, maybe not this time. Okay? That's mercy. That's mercy. It's the giving of another chance, another opportunity. Okay? So Jesus is a merciful high priest. He's also a faithful high priest. Now, he is 100% faithful to God. He didn't stumble in any way. And because of that, he's able to be this kind of high priest for us. Now, <clears throat> we're not going to... Well, if you like to turn, we're gonna. If you look at Hebrews chapter ten, verse eleven, or make a mark to look at it later, because there is a comparison made between priests in the uh, of the old covenant and the priests in the new covenant. Jesus, okay. Chapter ten, verse eleven. It says there that the priests in the old covenant, 
they stood. Okay? Or, yeah, they stood because their work was not finished. They continually stood at the altar. But then it says that Christ is sitting. What do you, why do you sit down? It's because your work is completed. So we have a contrast between standing and sitting. There's another contrast between daily, right? The priests of the old covenant had to minister daily to the people, day in and day out. It's exhausting. Christ sacrificed once. One sacrifice for all people, for all time. And lastly, lastly, the priests of the old covenant, they had to minister daily sacrifices that couldn't take away sins. Their sacrifices, they did make a temporary atonement, but the sins were still there. Christ's sacrifice completely removes sins. So how much better is the priesthood of Christ? His work is complete. His work is finished. By his one sacrifice, every sin you've ever committed can be washed away. It's off your record. It's never brought to remembrance ever again. Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus has destroyed Satan's power over us. And lastly this morning, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is a marvelous chapter. It lists so many men and women who were faithful throughout the old, the old law, or throughout the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament, okay? Chapter 12 follows up on that, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, those, that cloud of witnesses is everyone mentioned in chapter 11. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I want to slow down for a moment and think about those words, author and perfecter, and some different nuances that we might draw out of that. So as we think about the word author, we can think about it just as we think about the word author, someone who writes a book. Um, You know, I remember being in college. I was a junior, getting ready to graduate Freed Hardman with plenty of student loans. And at Christmas that year, my parents bought me Financial Peace by Dave Ramsey. And I was like, really? If you've ever seen the cover of a Dave Ramsey book, they just look dreadful. Okay? Well, I read the book. And now I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan, right? He has such great wisdom about how to manage your finances, right? So you might say Dave Ramsey wrote the book on personal finance. He authored that. Well, guess what? Jesus wrote the book on salvation, okay? Someone like Dave Ramsey, you might also say he's an authority on the subject, right? That's why people continue to call into his radio show based out of Nashville. That's not an advertisement for Dave Ramsey, but it could be if you need him, okay? So Dave Ramsey might be somebody who has the answers you need. Well, guess what? Christ has the answers we need. Now, as we think about a fictional author, okay, the author knows all the ins and outs of their story. They know the characters. They know the beginning. They know all the plot to us. They know how it ends. They put it all together for us. There's no surprises, right? Well, guess what? Jesus knows the ins and outs of our story, okay? He wrote the book on salvation. He is the authority on, our sub, uh, on the subject. He has all the answers. He knows the ins and outs of, of our story and where we're going and what we need. He knows the beginning because he was there in the beginning in Genesis. He knows how it's all going to end because he is not only the alpha, but he's also the omega. So there's no surprises with Jesus. He is the author of of our faith. That word perfecter is a word, I'm going to be honest, I don't use the word perfecter a lot in my daily lingo. There's some other words that I think might do a better job of describing what Jesus is, and one of those is the word pioneer. Pioneer, and maybe you're using a translation that uses that word this morning, but you think about when someone pioneers a new land geographically, they are making pads, they are making trails, they're, they are going to do some things and bring civilization. You might even say they are a trailblazer. When someone pioneers an industry, whether it's something in the tech industry or the automobile industry, right now things are shifting towards battery-powered cars, which is pretty interesting. But there are some pioneers leading, that, leading those developments. <clears throat> Jesus is our pioneer. He leads the way. He blazes the trail. And as we are running, we are running this race with endurance, but we're running behind Jesus. We're not having to clear out the bushes and 
make the trail through the woods. Jesus has already done those things. We are just following him. I'd like to think about one more illustration. There's a book by Steve Farrar called Point Man, and he talks about how specifically, and this is probably true for many uh, you know, engagements with the military, but he says in Vietnam, they had what they would call a point man. And this point man, as they went through the jungle in unknown territory, would be 20 yards, 50 yards, 100 yards ahead, walking the path. They were the point man. They were the leader. They would look out for danger. They would look out for anything that, needed to, that the rest of the troop needed to be made aware of. Okay, Jesus is our pioneer. He's our trailblazer. He's our point man. He is the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. He has completed faith. He has lived it out successfully. As the, as the Hebrews writer said, um, at verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and listen to what Jesus endured. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus himself kept his eyes on heaven. He, and because of that, he was able to endure the cross. He despised the shame, but he sat down. He finished the course, and now he's sitting at the right hand of God. You only sit down when your work is done. What were Jesus' last words on the cross? But it is finished. And so without the book of Hebrews, I believe we would have an incomplete portrait of Christ. Its contributions and beauty need to be appreciated. And today's portraits of Christ are only a sampling. And so we don't know what Jesus looked like physically, but we know what Jesus is like. We're told all throughout Scripture the heart and the mind of Jesus towards us. As we conclude today, I want to think about Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. The line there, the verse says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Our conclusion today, our conclusion every day is the same question the Hebrews writer gave. How can we escape any of these, any of these things, any of these warnings, if we neglect so great a salvation and so wonderful a Savior? How much better if we face trials and persecution, unlike the, the audience written to in Hebrews, how much better would we be if we ran to Jesus rather than away from Jesus? And so the questions this morning is, is Jesus your pioneer? Is Jesus your leader? Is Jesus the author of your faith? Jesus wrote the book on salvation. He's the main character. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for my sins. And he defeated death by rising again on the third day and ascending into heaven. And, this, and scripture tells us he is sitting at the right hand of God, desiring that we would come to him through repentance, our, the confession of our faults, baptism, and living a life worthy of our calling. I'm just a visitor here today. I do have family that lives here, but I'm not here often enough to be able to know what's going on in your life. But you do, and you know where you stand. What I do know is there are, there are people here willing to help walk with you along that journey and point you to Christ. Whatever need you may have this morning, I invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Father, again, we're thankful for this day, all of our many blessings, thankful for this time to come together and study your word and 
worship and praise, sing praises to thee. Pray that David is being gone this week. Have a safe trip. Thankful for Adam and his family being with us today. Be with Josh and Emily as they labor here with us. Be with our elders and deacons as they work with us as well. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.